हिंदुइज्म एंड अमेरिका बहुत ही बढ़िया बुक है जो लिखी है जय बंसल जी और कल्याण विश्वनाथ जी ने इस बुक को पढ़ना इसलिए भी हम सब के लिए बहुत ही इम्पॉर्टेंट है क्योंकि ये इतिहास है हम भारतीयों का हम हिंदुओं का अमेरिका में और मेरी कोशिश होगी कि अपने शो के राही इस बुक के बारे करीब हर महीने दो तीन बार आपके साथ चर्चा करूं इसके जितना कंटेंट है वो बहुत बढ़िया है तीन पार्ट्स में ये बुक है और कल्चरल हेरिटेज की बात करती है ये बुक हाउ हिंदू थॉट इन्फ्लुएंस्ड अमेरिका उसकी बात होती है परस्पेक्टिव्स ऑफ कंटेम्प्रेरी हिंदू अमेरिकन इसकी बात होती है और फिर उनके आगे चैप्टर्स हैं ये बुक मेरा जी चाहता है कि ऑडिबल फॉर्म में भी हो हिंदी में भी हो और इसके साथ साथ इस बुक को जब आप पढ़ेंगे आप देखेंगे हम आपको स्क्रीन पे इस बुक को लिंक भी देंगे ताकि आप इसको बाय कर सकें जब आप इस बुक को पढ़ेंगे तो आपको एहसास होगा कि इस बुक का जो पिक्टोरियल जो ग्राफिक काम है उस पर वीडियो डॉक्यूमेंट्रीज बनना चाहिए चूँकि ये एक सिंपल बुक नहीं है बल्कि इतिहास है ये सिर्फ इतिहास नहीं है बल्कि डॉक्यूमेंट्रीज है डॉक्यूमेंटेड कर दिया है जय बंसल जी ने कल्याण विश्वनाथ जी ने मैं इन दोनों का स्वागत करता हूं अमेरिका से हमारे साथ जुड़े हुए हैं स्वागत जय भाई आपका कल्याण जी वेलकम टू ज्वाइनिंग अस टुडे वी आर वेरी ग्रेटफुल फॉर बोथ ऑफ यू टू स्पेयर योर टाइम Uh, मैं आपसे बातचीत शुरू करता हूं जय भाई आप जरा हमसे करीब बैठे हुए हैं न्यू जर्सी में कल्याण जी जरा दूर हमसे बैठे हुए हैं लेकिन उनकी बातें भी हमारे लिए बहुत इम्पॉर्टेंट हैं इस बुक को लिखने का ख्याल आप दोनों के मन में कैसे आया जी 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 तहर भाई पहले तो मैं आपका शुक्रिया अदा करना चाहता हूँ आपके व्यूअर्स को मेरा बहुत बहुत नमस्कार आ, और आपका शुक्रिया अदा इसलिए करना चाहता हूं क्योंकि आ, ये किताब जो है बुक जो है एक्चुअली बहुत इम्पोर्टेंट है हिंदू अमेरिकन हिंदू कनेडियंस के लिए आ, ताकि वो जाने उनका यानी कि ये एक्चुअली कहानी उनकी है ये उनका इतिहास है और उनका इतिहास है और उनके पूर्वजों का इतिहास है जिन्होंने मतलब है कि हिंदू संस्कृति को यहाँ लाए और उसको उसको बढ़ावा दिया उसको आगे यानी कि यहाँ उसकी जड़ें यानी कि बनाई इस इस धरती पे तो इसलिए सबको ये जानना जरूरी है तो आपका सवाल ये है कि हमारे मन में इसका ख्याल कैसे है तो देखिए ऐसा है कि अगर आप देखें यू नो हिंदू अमेरिकन जो भी मतलब लेटेस्ट वेव ऑफ इमिग्रेशन ऑफ हिंदू अमेरिकन is about 50 years old in this country uh you know uh, first generation people like me and uh, you know i um, i don't know when you came to this country but you know our journey started in the in in 60s or early 70s for some of us and so we are reaching that you know half century mark or we have reached that half century mark and you know this is what is remarkable about this you know half century of hindu presence in this you know country whether it's america or the uh, or canada is that you know we came actually with very little money in our pocket you know we did not have uh, uh, material resources but you know we established ourselves financially uh, we raised our next generation to be very responsible citizens of these you know of, of north america uh, and in addition to that it is remarkable the 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 level of contribution you know this pioneering generation has made to their adopted societies so you know so you reach this 50 year mark and you look back and you say look you know this these are wonderful accomplishments you know it is unprecedented for any immigrant group if you if you look at the history of immigration so there is a story here that we felt needed to be told okay and and of course you know the uh, this pioneering pioneering generation now is reaching in their you know mid to late 70s some of them 80s and so on and so forth so we felt this is the time to do it so that we can pay a tribute to them before they leave this earth and uh, and also leave a legacy of course for for the next generation to really 
uh, read about their, their journey and their contributions and so forth. So that's how it got started. Um, and, uh, you know, I can tell you some concrete things uh, and maybe maybe uh, maybe you want to, you know, take it in some different direction. But, you know, um, I, I can elaborate uh, elaborate on that if you, you know, if you like a little bit further. Uh, Kalyan, do you want to add something uh, yeah, to that? Sure. G. Kalyanji, so, uh, welcome and, uh, uh, you know, your dedication and commitment towards Hindu dharma is remarkable. And uh, we all South Asians uh, and especially Hindus of all backgrounds appreciate uh, your com contribution towards uh, Sanatan dharma. So, uh, as, Kal as Jay Bhai was uh, mentioning about the journey of uh, uh, this book and we also mm, have a subtitle how Hindu Dharma transforming the West. That transformation is very important and you are the vital part of that transformation. So, uh, how would you like to comment what is the book about? You are the author of this book. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the story of how uh, Hindu thought has slowly come into America uh, and uh, and uh, diffused into various uh, parts of various segments of American society. Uh, it's a very interesting story. Um, it, it did not happen suddenly. Uh, it did not happen due to any one single individual. Uh, it happened uh, wave after wave after wave of people coming in with their ideas and thoughts different uh, gurus, swamis, acharyas, artists, musicians, uh, you know, the, for example, the, 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 uh, the, the way the yoga has taken over the West uh, and become part of Western life uh, is, is really quite uh, uh, un, un, unprecedented and, and could not have been predicted. Uh, nobody could have predicted how much yoga would uh, would become popular in the West and so on. So th there is a very clear uh, uh, absorption, diffusion, and adoption of Hindu ideas, concepts, practices, values, even though they may not be recognized as Hindu, and they are slowly getting assimilated into this, in this new category called uh, spiritual, but not religious. You know, a lot of people here in the West today, they say we are non-denominational, we are spiritual, but not religious. But really, if you see what they are doing, the practices they are adopting, you know, vegetarianism, veganism, uh, you know, introducing meditation and yoga in their lives and so on. It is a slow process of diffusion of Hindu ideas and thought into Western culture. And we thought we should... Uh, uh, speak about it in the form of this book in, a, in an easy reading kind of style. So that's the genesis of this book. No, this is absolutely worth reading book. Kalyanji, I would like to know more from you. How did you get started on it? Describe mm -hmm. the journey of how this book came into uh, being. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, there was a conference uh, held in the year 2018 called the Threats Conference. In fact, uh, Jay Bansalji was uh, involved in the organization of that conference. Um, in fact, you know, I, I would suggest maybe Jay Ji should talk about the conference first, and then I'll pay, bring. I'll speak a little bit after that. Uh, Jay Ji, why don't you take that up? Sure. Thank you, Kalanji. Mm -hmm. As I was, in fact, uh, intimately involved uh, with with that conference, it was uh, actually uh, November two thousand nineteen, uh, and uh, the the you know the idea that I, I you know I started with you know the, uh, that Hindu Americans have been here for about half century and we want to talk about their contribution. That actually, uh, Tairbai was precisely the the reason that conference was held. You know, our initial idea was simply hold the conference, bring some, you know, thought leaders from, from the Hindu diaspora here and let them talk about their journey and their accomplishments and their trials and tribulations. And uh, so, so we held the conference in Boston. It was a very successful conference. Uh, we had some 60, uh, you know, marquee speakers from all over, uh, you know, North America, as you, in fact, you were one of the invited speakers, as you may recall. Um, and, 
so we, you know, the conference uh, was held and that was very well, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it went very well. So our thought was, okay, let's just document the, you know, whatever was said at the conference, you know, let's try to summarize that so that we can, you know, uh, leave the this conversation for posterity for the next generation. So we started working on that. And, uh, you know, that was done relatively easily, fairly early. But, you know, once once we looked at, uh, you know, that the, the product of that, we said, well, you know, that looks pretty empty without actually having some idea of what these people actually, you know, what they brought here that that made these accomplishments possible. You know, just just saying, you know, we did this thing is not good enough. I think you have to say, you know, what you what you are as a society, as a culture, as a civilization, as people. So, you know, so we decided to talk about the cultural heritage of of those who came here uh, with basically empty pockets, but very rich, you know, upstairs in their heads, in you know, in in their uh, in their culture, you know. Uh, uh, stamina, if you like. So, so we wrote, uh, uh, you know, uh, various aspects of that, uh, you know, cultural heritage. And quite frankly, at that point, you know, we thought, okay, the book is done. Um, but then we realized that, you know, we are really picking up the story, you know, uh, almost, you know, midway in 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 its journey because reality is. Uh, Tarbai Hindu thought has been here a lot longer than you know uh, Hindu Americans have been here, <laughs> you know, uh, if I could say say it that way. Um, I mean, you know, the translated uh, uh, copies of uh, our scriptures traveled here in uh, you know late 18th century. Uh, you know, after uh, William Jones, you know, suddenly discovered Sanskrit and you know people started translating. Um, you know, you have uh, people like Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, you know, picking it up and, uh, you know, uh, Thoreau and some of the other people uh, getting into it. So Hindu thought was spreading here for, you know, that long. And there's some really nice quotes in the book I, uh, that I'd like to point to at some point in our conversation. Uh, so, so we realized that, you know, we really have to write from the very start which is, you know, how Hindu thought actually, you know, got to these shores and then how it got, you know, planted here, how it got transmitted and then adapted by the people here and and in some cases changed quite a bit and in some cases, you know, they some in some cases they even denied the, uh, the source, but nevertheless, the thought doesn't, you know, the thought continued to live on. So we said, okay, that part of the, you know, the journey also has to be written. So that's how, you know, that's how this this entire book came together. I think uh, finally, uh, you know, we said, okay, I think I think now we have a reasonably complete history of Hindu thought and Hindus in America. Uh, so at that point, we said, okay, this this is this is the this is the book, and uh, we move on. You said that uh, finally we have uh, something concrete in our hand and uh, so uh, Kalyanji, I would like uh, you to continue what you were saying. So um, about the journey of book, what would you like to say more about that? Yeah, so when we started uh, contemplating, you know, uh, the, uh, the movement of Hindu ideas, Hindu thought, Hindu concepts, into practices into uh, the United States of America, we had to go back in time a little bit. And we started doing some uh, basic research on this. Uh, and we started looking at uh, who are all the key contributors, you know, who brought what to America and who received it on the American side, you know, who are the recipients uh, and how this thought <coughs> moved uh, from uh, uh, India to, to here. Uh, and, and what we noticed was there were three distinct phases uh, of the movement of thought. The very first phase, some a few books started uh, coming to America. A few Sanskrit texts were translated, they were brought here. The early uh, American transcendentalists like uh, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson and uh, 
Henry David Thoreau and Walt Whitman, they started reading uh, some Sanskrit texts. They read Bhagavad Gita, some Upanishads, and so on. And on their own, they began to develop an appreciation for uh, Hindu thought and ideas. At that time, there were no Hindus here. There, there only the texts had come. You fast forward a little bit. The, the first big visit in America was Swami Vivekananda's uh, arrival here in uh, 1893 at the Parliament of Religions in Chicago. And that was a watershed moment because he started talking a lot about yoga. He started talking about uh, the four types of yoga, Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga, Raja Yoga, and Bhakti Yoga, and so on. And that was a very critical moment. And as you move forward, then there was Paramahamsa Yogananda who came here and set up the Self-Realization Fellowship. You move a little bit forward in time, you got all the other major stars who came in, you know, Swami Sachidananda, Swami Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, <coughs> the sure. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada, uh, and on and on. So many people had come <coughs> and contributed their thought here, and it, it got mixed. And on the receiving side, there were many, many people who were very receptive to yoga and made it their own. Uh, so I think that's the second phase of the transmission of thought. Of course, the third phase is when we all came here, bringing our culture and traditions, started building our own temples, uh, our own activities, started our own activities, and so on. So there's been a, you can think of it in three phases, how this transmission has occurred. And we thought we will document all of that. Uh, so that is how this uh, this book sort of expanded beyond the conference uh, and, and acquired a, a larger backstory, so to speak. So, Jai what drove the timing of this book? Yeah, good question. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, the it was really the, this realization that the uh, first generation uh, you know, Hindu Americans are here for, you know, half a century. So half a century is a sort of a good, uh, you know, uh, point in time to look back and say, you know, what that journey has been like, you know, all their trials and tribulations and, you know, great accomplishments and, and so on and so forth. So that was kind of the driving thought. But, but also remember, I mean, you know, uh, 50 years means uh, the pioneering generation is now reaching their, you know, is in their golden years. Uh, so, you know, uh, if you want to write their history and, you know, you have to, you know, you have to tap into their, uh, their, you know, uh, that, that, that resource before, before they leave us. And, you know, quite frankly, we're, you know, at least I'm part of that, uh, that generation. So it's, uh, you know, we just felt that this was, I, the, the other thing is, uh, you know, uh, of course, the next generation, they're, they're uh, you know, you know, uh, grown up. First generation is certainly grown up. And I mean, the, the, the next generation is grown up and they are now into, um, you know, into their years when uh, they need to be able to relate to, you know, their, you know, their, their forefathers story in some way and be able to pass it on to their children, you know, so so we just felt that this was, you know, just the right point in time for us to uh, take a pause, take a look, and uh, you know, say something about it in a cogent fashion. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, we we could have written, you know, a tome, yeah, two hundred page, three hundred page, you know, thick text that you know sits on sits on, uh, you know, bookshelves and hardly anyone reads them, you know, except few dedicated uh, individuals. Uh, so that was not the game we, you know, really the, the, the way we wanted to do it. So so we uh, decided to do it in a, in a coffee table fashion where, you know, you have a lot of pictures that, that, that draw people in, but then, you know, there is, there is a text that goes with it that, that gives you know, that sense of history, that flow of time and flow of events. So, you know, every, every time you open a book, even if you engage with it for 10, 15 minutes, I mean, it is it is our uh, impression uh, that you will find something new and interesting, 
more than one thing, I'm sure, but you'll find something new and interesting even in 10, 15 minutes, which you won't get in a you know, large, uh, uh, deep, deep thought textbook. Or, so that's that's the, that was the timing and, and a little bit uh, you know the, the the format of the book. Right, Kalyanji, is this book strictly about uh, Hindu thought in uh, America, or is it about the entire Western world? As the claim, as the subtitle suggests, how Hindu dharma is transforming the West. How do you support the subtitle with the title? Yeah, that's a very bold subtitle. Right, uh, it is. Uh, that is actually making a claim that Hindu dharma is transforming the West. Um, you know, and how is it happening? Well, uh, when is it happening? Really speaking, right? So when we look at that question, one of the things that has become very clear is that uh, you know the the West was founded on uh, principles of uh, Christian thought. <laughs> You know, Christian thought that originated uh, from Europe, uh, and uh, within the Christian world, there is a sense that there is one truth, uh, and you know, uh, that has to be upheld uh, through Jesus. And other paths, other religions, other traditions are somehow not as as true as the Christian truth. In fact, uh, Christianity has this strong notion that uh, you know non-Christian traditions are, uh, are, are are invalid in some way. Now, the um, increasingly Americans are are embracing the view that may, maybe that's not the case. Maybe there are many paths to the truth. Maybe there are many ways, many methods, many traditions, and a lot of different different. Uh, uh, traditions, sampradayas, to use a Sanskrit word, can actually coexist. Now, this coexistence of sampradayas is a very foundational idea in Hindu dharma. Uh, and Hinduism has always promoted such a vast variety of traditions, and cultures, <coughs> subcultures, you know, sects and so on. Uh, as America embraces its role as a kind of a melting pot or a salad bowl, as they say, Different different traditions uh, uh, come and uh, uh, maintain their their respective traditions and identities in this salad bowl called America. So, in accepting the multiplicity of traditions, uh, the coexistence of traditions in a fundamental way, uh, America is is transforming in its uh, core understanding of the place of religion, spirituality, etc. That's one way. The second way is. The, the the idea of spirituality, you know, the the consciousness, uh, you know, being able to uh, be silent, uh, go into meditation, just sit quietly, calm the tempers down. Now, after all, you know, the uh, as you all know, you know, t temperamentally, America is very volatile, especially right now, with all the shootings that are going on. The, Political crises, the uh, uh, unrest with the polarization uh, in the community, and so on and so forth. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, instability, unrest, uh, emotional disturbance that's going on, and and really it reflects in schools, in colleges, uh, uh, all over the place. Uh, and the answer to this is not. Ultimately, not give everybody a gun and let everybody uh, have at it. You know that is that cannot be the answer. So the, the only way to find equilibrium and quiet and peace and contentment, <coughs> focus on oneself and, and diffuse the tension within that each person is facing. And that idea that going inward uh, and finding a, 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 a place within oneself where one can be at at peace can be contented and accept the world as it is and embrace its diversity and plurality. These are definitely core values of Hindu Dharma, which are profoundly impacting this, uh, uh, this country, uh, even if they don't explicitly acknowledge it, they are embracing it. And you can see it in the movies, you know, like Avatar, like The Matrix, 
like Star Wars, the Force, may the Force be with you, and so on. I mean, these are ideas that are definitely coming from the East, uh, and that is uh, that's how I see it, as in how it is slowly, slowly penetrating the mainstream consciousness of the West. Yeah, if I could just add a little, little bit to that, uh, um, uh, uh, we actually covered this uh, uh, in the intro itself uh, to the book, uh, but. Specifically, you know, uh, there was uh, an article in uh, Newsweek magazine in 2009. Uh, the author was uh, Lisa Miller, and she uh, the, the title of that uh, uh, of that article was uh, "We Are All Hindus Now." No, that was based actually on a, and and it you know drew a lot of controversy. That was uh, discussed in media quite a lot. Uh, that was based on a 2008 uh, survey of you know that was done in America. So she uh, she makes some very specific uh, quantitative uh, observations from that survey. In that in that so you know uh, allow me to just give you two or three of those uh, you know state statements from her uh, article. Uh, so she says here. Uh, <clears throat> So, um, yeah, uh, so she says, America no longer is buying the concept that there is only one way to divinity, which is, you know, the Abrahamic uh, way of thinking about divinity. She says that according to a 2008 Pew survey, 65% of the Americans believe that there are many ways to connect with divinity. Now, that is a quintessential Hindu idea. <clears throat> now, uh, she also points out in her article that, uh, uh, you know, out of that 65%, 37% of them actually are evangelists. So, so that, that, now that, that's, a, that's a very interesting observation. Now, the other thing is uh, nearly a third of, you know, of North Americans are... Um, you know, they they don't bury their dead. They they actually, uh, you know, um, have a you know a funeral. They, you know, um, uh, what you call it? Uh, you know, cremation. A, a cremation. Yeah. So they use the cremation process. Now, uh, you might say, well, what is what is the significance of that? Well, the significance of that, as you I'm sure know, is that uh, in in the Abrahamic faith system, you know, uh, having the body available. Uh, on the judgment day is extremely, extremely critical. I mean, that is, um, whereas in Hindu belief, uh, body is disposable after death, soul is, soul goes on. So, so this, this, this fact that, you know, one third of the Americans are actually committing their dead is very, very significant. And it's, you know, it is very much, you know, uh, comes from the Hindu thought system that says, body is no, not, not useful to you anymore. And that is actually up from six percent in early seventies. So just imagine. You know, so, so there, there are a lot of and and again, I, I should point out that we are not a proselytizing. Uh, you know, Hindu dharma is not proselytizing uh, dharma. You know, we don't ask anyone to you know go through a conversion process. You can just take up good ideas, use them in your uh, you know daily life, and uh, you know um, you don't have to call yourself a Hindu. It's, those are just ideas to kind of run your life in a, you know, more sort of a thoughtful um, way, consistent with and, you know, uh, friendly uh, with, you know, with the nature and so on and so forth. So there are many, many different parts, pieces of data. Yoga is now a $80 billion industry. Um, uh, meditation was the, the most uh, popular term during two years of lockdown during COVID, you know, uh, as people uh, uh, were, you know, developing these, I guess, you know, personal anxieties, tensions, so on and so forth. So I think their signs are there. You just have to, you know, look look at them and collate them, and and we've tried to kind of tap into that uh, that sort of uh, uh, data in, in this book. Who's the intended uh, audience of this book? Hindu mm -hmm. Americans. Are Americans, are Hindus across the planet, are Hindus uh, in the Western world? So, sure. what is the precise uh, uh, audience uh, uh, for this book? 
You know, uh, I like to think that it's all of the above. Uh, of course, uh, you know, um, it it's difficult for me to predict that the, uh, you know, non-Hindu Americans would, you know, reach out for this book as a matter of course. Uh, but I think there are a lot of curious non-Hindu um, Americans and Canadians who might be interested in looking at, you know, uh, how various thoughts in, you know, this is Hindu thought here, how various thoughts are coming and merging with, uh, you know, with the native thought, uh, with the Judeo-Christian thought system, and how they are changing the, the, the society, uh, and what were they changing. So, so I think, you know, as a matter of curiosity, they, they would probably want to look at it. But, you know, I would be happy, and I'm sure Kalanji would be happy if, you know, every, just, you know, every Hindu-American family actually picked, you know, uh, had the book at their coffee table because it is, you know, more than a conversation piece. Uh, my own generation should be interested in just knowing, you know, look, you know, taking a look at their own history. I think so from that perspective, they should be interested in it. But, you know, what next generation should be interested in it because it's, you know, it's the history of that that made them what they are. Okay. Um, and uh, and I would venture to say that even a 15 year old can get a lot out of it. See, I I look at you know a 15 year old and what does he know about all the you know things that have happened in the last 50 years? You know how how this whole thing you know is is gone. I mean they know us as parents, grandparents, uncles and aunts. You know doing our stuff, whatever that stuff is. You know engineers, doctors, whatever have you. But do they really get a sense of the accomplishment of, you know, their forefathers, their ancestors have achieved in that short span of time? So, um, you know, to to you know uh, to conclude, what I'm you know, can say, I mean, basically, I think it should appeal to everyone. Uh, but of course, you know, it remains to be seen. You know, I I say, you know, books and umbrellas, you know, uh, they have something in common. You know, um, they don't work unless you open them. <laughs> so, so I think, I think you know, buying a book is one thing, but actually opening and taking a look at it, uh, I, I think is is going to be a very rewarding experience to whosoever actually you know does open it. Yeah, Jaybai, you said very well. Uh, books are meant to read and to ponder on. Uh, so, uh, Kalyanji, as we see the contents of this book. There are three parts, cultural heritage part one, and uh, that part has uh, many chapters. And then the part second is how Hindu thought influenced America, very important part. And uh, that got a couple of chapters. And then the part three, perspectives of uh, contemporary Hindu Americans, very, very uh, important uh, part. So. Uh, how would you describe uh, briefly what is covered in those chapters, in those parts uh, in the book? <coughs> okay. So, uh, maybe the first part, uh, Jay, Jay Bansanji was uh, primarily responsible. I will invite him to share. And maybe I can take a little bit uh, time and explain the second part. And then we'll get to the third, third part after that. So, Jayji, why don't you take the first shot? Sure. You know, talking about the cultural heritage of uh, you know any any society, any community is obviously a pretty pretty sizable task. Um, we uh, we try to break it down into you know uh, a number of number of value systems that you know we thought we could you know uh, you know we could we could explore. So first and foremost. You know what is the basic Hindu thought system? I mean, you know, people in in the West uh, a lot of times confused about uh, what Hinduism is. You know, they they think of a, you know Murti Puja and you know believing in many gods and so on and so forth. But you know, in reality, there is a there is a very strong you know under philosophical underpinning that is common to all those sampradayas, all those thought systems. And we try to distill that uh, in the, you know, uh, to, to start off uh, as part of the cultural heritage. So it 
talks about the uh, the concept of Brahman, talks this, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, the law of karma, the reincarnation, and, you know, uh, what is a personal deity, Ishwar, and so on and so forth. So, talk a little bit about, you know, what Hindu dharma actually at the very root of it is. Uh, then we talk about, you know, a very important subject that, that I think a lot of time doesn't get, uh, you know, uh, discussed, and that is the family system. See, we, we look upon society, uh, you know, family to us is the basic unit of a society, uh, whereas in the Western world, individual is the basic unit of society. And, uh, and, and I believe that, you know, our family value or family system is really the competitive advantage that uh, Hindu Americans have had. Uh, in this world. So we talk quite a bit about uh, how that family works in practice, how how intergen, you know, uh, different generations sort of depend on each other for, uh, you know, in, in different ways uh, in carrying out their, you know, passing their traditions and and also in the process looking after the, uh, the older generation in a very comfortable surroundings. Uh, and then we talk about some of the, you know, things like uh, you know, the, the milestones in life, what we call sanskars. We talk uh, about uh, some of the goals in life uh, that we talk about, the, you know, st various stages of life. Uh, and and then the Pushartha, you know, which is a Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. A lot of people are, you know, uh, familiar with them, but a lot of them don't realize how they connect into this ecosystem called Hindu Dharma. Uh, and we try to show also that... Uh, uh, Hindu dharma is inherently pluralistic. You know, and you look at uh, any of our scriptures, they talk about, uh, you know, well, they, they think well of everyone, not just a selected club of people. So, you know, we try to give some excerpts from our scriptures to, to dis, you know, to, to display that. Uh, Hinsa is a very big uh, aspect of it and how it relates to not just, uh, you know, uh, vegetarianism and, you know, some of the other things and, and health and whatever have you, but also how it relates to eco-friendliness, how, you know, um, Hindu Dharma looks at nature uh, having its own rights. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we have a deep reverence for knowledge. You know, we call Guru Daivo Bhava teacher is, I mean, equated to divine in our, in our system. And um, so we have built a lot of, lot of rituals around, uh, you know, acquisition of knowledge. And we talk about that. And then we talk about the system of, uh, you know, knowledge that Hindu Dharma is based on. Uh, there are many, many uh, pages, six, seven pages, just, uh, just dedicated to that part. Uh, and you know, talk about some of the ancient universities that, unfortunately, you know, have been have been ruined by the various uh, you know invaders. But you know, they're coming back slowly and uh, but surely. And then you know, what is very interesting is uh, a number of quotes from very famous you know thought leaders in the West. Uh, we wanted to make sure that you know we did not include any Hindu thought leaders in here. We wanted to actually have this truth being spoken through the mouths of the Western thought leaders. So there are 30 different uh, uh, individuals who have said, you know, uh, things, you know, observed things about Hindu Dharma that uh, we have tried to include in here. And I'll just uh, read maybe one of them just, just so to get a sense of, uh, uh, yeah, just just to give your audience a sense of uh, you know, what we're talking about. So here is Ralph Waldo Emerson. You know, he's uh, early 19th century. He says, in the great book books of India, an empire spoke to us, nothing small or unworthy, but large, serene, consistent, the voice of an old intelligence, which in another age and climate had pondered and thus disposed of the questions that exercise us today. So uh, think of that. Uh, think of uh, Niels Bohr. You know, he is uh, uh, from the early 20th century. He was a, um, a Nobel laureate physicist. And he says, I go to Upanishads to ask questions. So, and the, the, the 30 like that, I you know, don't, don't want to, uh, you know, uh, go into all of them here. 
then we talk about uh, various uh, civilizational contributions to mathematics, astronomy, to arts, to literature, to uh, I mean, a pretty uh, to 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 technology and uh, and and many and mind sciences in particular. And then you know, it's a, so so point being that in the cultural heritage part, we try to explore these different aspects of you know what makes up one's culture or civilization. Um, sorry, it's been a little bit long, uh, you know, uh, dissertation, but uh, uh, let me turn the floor over to uh, to Kalyanji for further explanation. G. Kalyanji, please. Okay. So now that takes us to the part two of the book. <clears throat> part two basically then uh, takes a historical view. It goes back in time uh, to the days of uh, the first books coming to America and uh, you know, Americans being exposed to the notion of uh, a higher consciousness, you know, sp the uh, higher spirituality, uh, ideas of uh, meditation, or knowing oneself, what we call Atma Jnana, right? Be still and know yourself. Uh, and, and, you know, ultimately life is about finding peace and quiet and contentness, contentedness in one's own life which when we find that, we can share it with others. Uh, otherwise, it is, uh, it is always a conflict, uh, uh, you know. So, it, we have these two notions, you know, a society that is constantly breeding on conflict, internal conflict. It develops using conflict as a, as a mechanism to advance. And then there is a society which is, uh, which moves in the other direction towards uh, a, a, an inner, an inward contentedness and peace. And that idea begins to resonate in America, even with the very early uh, transcendentalist uh, movements. And of course, uh, Swami Vivekananda takes the whole country by storm in some ways. Uh, and there's a new uh, root, a new, uh, a, a new root begins to, to now flower. The Vedanta societies are uh, uh, set up in different parts of the country. Uh, there is uh, the Hollywood center of uh, Vedanta, uh, there is uh, New York, I mean, some of these places are still there, Chicago and so on. All over there is a new sprouting of Hindu thought. Very soon yoga comes into America in the form of uh, Paramahamsa Yogananda and Self-Realization Fellowship. And yoga is immediately taken up in the, if you, take, if you look at the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, uh, there's a phenomenon called J. Krishnamurti who comes to America and he becomes uh, another uh, superstar amongst the elite in America. And they start to understand and assimilate uh, an entirely new way of being. You know, instead of being outwardly focused, uh, always trying to aggressively acquire and procure and accumulate, uh, you know, what if you let go? And lived more lightly on the planet, you know, and uh, and there is the notion that ultimately real <clears throat> happiness, real joy, comes uh, only from within. Now there is no outer circumstance that can arrange things in such a way that one becomes absolutely and totally happy forever and ever after, never to be uh, you know disturbed in any way. Uh, the, the idea is we have to find an inner peace in the midst of all the turmoil that's going on, constantly going on. Uh, and, and we find that as time moves on, uh, many, many more people come from, uh, from India to the West. Uh, there is this uh, whole place called Yogaville, there is Woodstock, there is the whole uh, countercultural revolution of the 1960s. Uh, you might recall people like Osho, Rajneesh. Uh, he creates a huge storm in America, and, and all his uh, work is based on meditation, you know, tantra, dynamic meditation, and it has a big uh, intersection with American culture. Uh, and of course, uh, Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada, uh, you know, he's another phenomenon. He he brings the the Bhakti tradition, the mm -hmm. singing and dancing on street corners, uh, the prolific uh, writings that he did on on Krishna, mm -hmm. Sri Krishna. The whole ISKCON movement uh, takes root in America, and in fact, a lot of Americans are attracted to that. ISKCON is an international movement, 
today in, in so many countries, largely powered by Westerners. Uh, in, in California, there's a place called Mount Madonna. I don't know if you've heard of that, uh, Tahir Bhai. Mm. There's a beautiful little place in the mountains. Um, I have been there. Uh, it, it, was, it was set in motion by one, uh, uh, I think it was called Swami Haridas, uh, mm. Yogi Haridas. And uh, it is 100% uh, managed and run by white Americans. 100%. It is a very flourishing community with all the characteristics of uh, uh, Hindu culture, vegetarianism, veganism, non-violence, meditation, yoga, Ayurveda, uh, in a profound and deep embrace of the culture. They even have a Hanuman Mandir in the hills uh, in California. Uh, it's a beautiful place. Uh, like that, you know, as you move forward, there are more and more people there in, uh, you know, uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi is a pretty great phenomenon. Uh, he introduces transcendental meditation. He trademarks it and sets it uh, in motion in the rest. And so many Americans have meditated and embraced it and become very, you know, people don't know this. There was a person called uh, John Gray, Dr. John Gray, who wrote a book called uh, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. <laughs> a very famous, popular book that uh, took America by storm. I mean, he was a student of Maharishi Mahesh and you know, and it's not very well known, but he, a lot of his ideas he uh, he collected and distilled into the book that he created. Uh, our own time, we have our Deepak Chopra, who is quite a phenomenon. Uh, uh, <coughs> then, of course, you know, you had Indra Devi, a person called Eugenie Peterson, who uh, born and raised in America. She went to India. She spent many years in. Uh, Mysore, in the palace of the Maharaja in Mysore. She learnt yoga under the tutelage of uh, Krishama Acharya. And she comes back and sets up the first few st yoga studios in uh, Hollywood, in California. Then there is uh, this person called Magna uh, Baptiste. Mm. Uh, they are a big uh, a couple who popularize yoga for fitness and health and, and so on. Uh, and the movement goes on and on. And of course, everybody has heard of uh, BKS Iyengar, uh, who is a student of uh, uh, Krishnamacharya. And he comes, he's, he travels all over the world, sets up his own brand of yoga, Iyengar Yoga, as he calls it. And millions of Americans, Westerners, Europeans have learned yoga from uh, directly from BKS Iyengar or some of his students, uh, his son TKV, Desikachar, uh, and others. So you see this uh, tremendous uh, explosion of yoga in mean, thousands and thousands of yoga studios in every corner. Uh, and, and you know, I I I'm never uh, uh, I, I I'm never not amazed by seeing yet another yoga studio that calls itself uh, Om Yoga or uh, you know some other name you know Shiva Yoga or something like that you know. And, and the, the penetration is so deep. Uh, and so pervasive that uh, now there are arguments about is yoga really Hindu? Uh, can we take it over? Can we call it Christian yoga, Islamic yoga, Jewish yoga and so on? So just like uh, pizza has become everybody's food, yoga has now become everybody's uh, property. So the, that kind of deep penetration that yoga has had is a real phenomenon. I mean, uh, so this, uh, the second uh, section of the book really takes that into uh, a deeper consideration and chronicles the history of how that happened. There was a person called, uh, um, you, you know, the, the people, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas created uh, Star Wars and around the concept of uh, the Force, you know, the Force. And you have the right side, the bright side of the Force, and then you have the dark side of the Force, right? Mm -hmm. Which comes from really their... Uh, uh, years they spent with a person called uh, Joseph Campbell. <coughs> uh, Joseph Campbell was a great uh, mythologist, really speaking, and he, he wrote a book called The Hero's Journey. Uh, and he himself, in fact, uh, uh, studied under uh, the tutelage of one Ramakrishna uh, Vedanta Society uh, Swami in uh, New York City. Hmm. So these, the traces of how this, uh, this transmission has occurred, uh, is documented in the in the section two, and and, and you you know when you find it 
showing up in a movie like Avatar, you know, and you can see traces of Ramayana there, and you can see traces of Mahabharata in this uh, in these uh, stories, you know, uh, and you wonder where where are they getting it from? Uh, so there are the it goes back to the slow transmission of Hindu thought and ideas that have come into the United States of America. Of course, we, I should not fail to mention the Beatles, uh, you know, who, who uh, <clears throat> learned music, who fused uh, Indian and Western music with Pandit Ravi Shankar and so many other, uh, Ustad Amjad Ali Khan, so many others who brought the musical traditions into the West and so on. So it's a very rich tapestry of uh, what has happened. I mean, just one more thing I'll mention here. You know, yoga and uh, meditation and Ayurveda are slowly getting integrated into contemporary uh, medical uh, diagnosis and uh, treatment practices, where the idea of some kind of integrative medicine, where you know not only you engage in uh, Western medicine, but also integrate certain practices from the from the East, particularly from India, uh, are becoming more and more and more uh, commonplace in the West. In fact, in Harvard and other universities, they have started studying the effects of yoga scientifically <clears throat> and systematically, documenting in the form of well-researched papers, clinical study, uh, clinical data, and so on. Uh, and, and they are trying to actually demonstrate that these practices uh, they have had an ancient origin, but they are uh, very much relevant today and can be scientifically demonstrated to be valid and legitimate. So all of this is just uh, the slow and uh, powerful uh, movement of Hindu thought into the West. That is how we are looking at uh, the second section. Uh, and of course, the third section is from the conference, so Jayaji will be able to explain it wonderfully. Yeah, I just want to say a little bit, little bit more on the second part, and uh, you know, um, so you know, if you think of uh, India and and uh, Hindu dharma, three things immediately come to mind: spirituality, yoga, and meditation, right? And so everyone, you know, I mean, whether whether you know people are now talking about yoga, you know, Christian yoga, and and you know, appropriating some of these concepts, but reality is those three things are very distinct. And everyone knows that they are they are they are Hindu coming from Hindu thought system. But what is what is not obvious are the other two chapters in in part two, which is uh, the impact on what we call mind sciences and and art and literature. Um, so you know, um, for example, not very many people know that. Carl Jung. Now, Carl Jung is, you know, one of the uh, considered one of the pioneers after uh, Sigmund Freud of uh, modern psychology, psychiatry, psychology. He wrote a book on the psychology of Kundalini Yoga. He actually gave lectures on Kundalini Yoga, and uh, I have a quote here from uh, a professor of religious studies at uh, University of Calgary, uh, Harold Coward. He says to Jung, the Indian understanding seemed a great advance on the common Western view that a person's character is a particular admixture of blessings or curses which the fate or gods bestow on the child at birth. So his thought system is very much influenced by, uh, by Hindu thought system. So, you know, there is a tremendous amount of contribution to modern uh, science of psychology and psychiatry. And... Uh, of course, many of these thoughts have been taken up uh, and and uh, you know modified slightly, or the name has been changed slightly, so that you know attribution does not have to go back to uh, you know Hindu sources. But uh, but there is a tremendous you know, writing this book actually was not just a, you know a way to you know it's it's not a one way communication. We also learned a lot in the process in the process of researching. We learned a lot about you know, some of these uh, contributions. Um, so, so yeah, there is, a, there is a lot, there is a lot here in that system. Uh, let me uh, tell you a little bit about, uh, so there's, a, uh, let me see here. Yeah, so there's Herbert Benson, 
he uh, he took meditation and he called it the relax relaxation response it became his trademark uh, people so that people don't know it, it is coming from meditation but that's that's the genesis of it uh, you have uh, uh, something called mindfulness based stress reduction uh, technique um, by this fellow uh, John Kabat-Zinn that comes from the same place uh, so there is there is a lot more than meets the eye and uh, you know it's not just limited to yoga and spirituality it's just, it's just a lot more than that I was personally uh, actually pleasantly surprised at the amount of contribution uh, that Hindu thought has actually made to the Western literature. Third part of the book, as uh, you know, as we pointed out a little bit earlier, is uh, actually about you and I. You know, it's uh, it's our story in a way. You know, told through uh, the uh, you know voices of uh, these uh, sixty odd thought leaders that came to the conference and talked about their journeys and their uh, you know their their uh, life contributions. So uh, first of all, you know, the th it talks about actually the history of immigration um, you know I had the in the, I mean I didn't know that until early 1960 there are only 12,000 you know Hindus in North America 12,000 today in America alone is half four and a half million I think there is uh, about three quarter of a million now in in uh, in Canada so and then there are a lot of people who came from, uh, you know, not from India. So, that, you know, it's, it's much larger. So from 12,000 to, you know, how we got to the 7, 8 million um, figure is uh, is an interesting journey. It came in many ways. And we try to sort of, you know, give a flavor of how that happened. And then how, you know, I mean, you know, we, we look, we obviously look different. Uh, but we... We have uh, integrated ourselves very well into the society. How that integration took place, you know, not only in the professional spaces, but also in, you know, in, in, uh, you know, everyday, you know, social interactions. How did it, you know, um, become, you know, commonplace for a, you know, American to want to go to an Indian restaurant or, you know, um, um, buy from Indian grocery stores or, you know. Uh, you know, Indian music is not strange anymore in you know in in the Western spaces. So how did that all happen? I mean, you know, there is a there is a process, and we try to capture piece of that process. Uh, then uh, um, talking specifically about the the conference itself, uh, we had uh, the conference was divided. If I you know going from memory, I think eight or nine different uh, different panels. And there were people from the business world and entrepreneurs, uh, artists, people from uh, healthcare industry. And uh, so there was one panel that was a youth panel. We had story of nine, eight or nine young people talk about you know, how they see their place in this world, in, in, in the Western world. And I'll just give you a couple of quotes. Uh, here is a, a young lady, uh, her name is Ananya Pati. She is, uh, I think now she is probably uh, a junior uh, college. At that time she was, uh, I think, a senior, uh, high school senior. And she says, you know, more and more youth is coming to realize that they are not the leaders of tomorrow. They are leaders of today, she said. And uh, let me tell you, she has been she has been recognized for her work as a, as a leader in uh, uh, in fighting uh, uh, you know uh, drug abuse in in you know in schools and colleges. And she's she's traveled all over the world, you know, uh, showing how she's fought it, and, you know, and teaches others to to do the same. Uh, and then, of course, we had uh, some thought leaders uh, like yourself as well, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, Tahir Goraji, and we had um, uh, Rajiv uh, Malhotraji there, um, you know, give us a very broad perspective on, you know, our place in the Hindu society and what, how they see, uh, see us continuing to, you know, carve a new path uh, as we go forward. 
Um, and, you know, it's just, a, so it's really ca catching the voice of these, uh, these thought leaders from different domains uh, that uh, makes up part three of the, uh, the book. I mean, here we have some entrepreneurs that they talk about their journey. I mean, these people have, you know, uh, these are, um, you know, uh, uh, these are people who have started many, many industries, employed, you know, thousands, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of people. They started from scratch, uh, serial entrepreneurs, talking about, you know, what their, what values drives them to, uh, to uh, you know, to, to start these businesses. You know, it's not all about, you know, that, that's, that's one thing. It's, uh, it was invariably they keep coming back to that it was their, you know, Hindu tradition, Hindu value system that drove them to, and, uh, and, and, and uh, that is how they conduct their business in daily life. It's, it's not always profit motive. It's actually looking at a much broader perspective. So, uh, you know, it, it, it was actually very refreshing to get that perspective living in America where, I mean, rat race is, uh, is an everyday, uh, everyday thing. Just hearing these people talk about, you know, um, some very profound things um, that they do in their daily life. And these are people like you and I. So that's what uh, part three of the book is about. <clears throat> oh, wonderful. Kalyanji, before I conclude uh, today's discussion uh, with Jay by asking a question, how can our audience get this book? I would like to have your uh, conclusive remarks uh, on our today's discussion, please. Wonderful. So, uh, Tahir Bhai, see, you know, uh, I, I want to contextualize it in this way, you know. <clears throat> see, when when uh, two different civilizations come into contact with each other, uh, that contact can be uh, uh, very destructive or it can be very uh, potentially very constructive and contributory. We all know that when the West came into contact with the non-Western societies in the colonial era, that was a violent, uh, 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 and very destructive uh, engagement. The whole world was brought under the umbrella of colonialism, uh, colonial conquest. Uh, and we all know the story of North America, where the natives of North America were literally exterminated and, and uh, moved into reservations. Uh, somewhere between 50 to 80 million of them died to make way for the American civilization to flourish here. Similarly, Latin America was totally co colonized. Africans were taken as slaves bought and sold as, as though they were animals. Uh, you know, India was colonized. Uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, the, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, you name it, everything was brought under the heel of the, the Western uh, colonial powers. That is one way of engagement, a contract between civilizations. What we are talking about in this book is another model of civilizational engagement, but quietly, silently, without any coercion, uh, ideas from the Hindu world, Hindu cosmology, have <coughs> totally diffused like an agarbati, you know, like you, you, you put a little agarbati in the corner of a room, and then it slowly moves around and, and penetrates the atmosphere. Like that, it's a completely non-violent uh, and completely uh, undirected, meaning there's nobody directing it, you see. Nobody is controlling it. No, there's no uh, West India Company or something like that, which is <laughs> powering this movement, right? Uh, it is happening uh, on its own, on the merit of its, the power of the ideas, it is diffusing and, and influencing uh, uh, the, the almost the, the Western world and therefore the entire world. So I think that's the real story of how to engage the world gently, without coercion, on the strength and merit of the ideas, concepts, values, which we can contribute and share with the world. That's the story that the book really captures. I will conclude on that note. Oh, thank you very much for sharing very uh, refreshing thoughts about this book. 
today with our viewers. So finally, uh, Jay Bansal ji, I would like to ask and our viewers would like to know how can they get the copy of this book online, uh, e-form e or in the store, how could they get uh, a copy of this book? And I know this book is being published by Garuda uh, Prakashan, uh, Garuda Publishers. Please uh, tell our viewers, uh, Jay Bansal ji. Yeah, uh, correct, uh, Tarva. It's uh, been published by Garuda Prakashan, which is uh, uh, out of uh, uh, out of Delhi uh, area, um, uh, Gurugram to be exact. Um, so it's uh, listed on Amazon India right now, uh, but viewers in North America can, can still uh, get a copy of the book. Uh, it it'll eventually uh, you know get listed on Amazon US as well. Uh, I think the uh, the publisher has some negotiations going on with them that I haven't concluded. But in the meantime, they can order it from um, uh, from you know my organization. We have a number of copies available, and uh, uh, rather than me reading out you know the email address, uh, I think if you wouldn't mind just displaying it on the screen, uh, it's uh, avm at uh, vhp dash america dot org. Uh, but uh, yeah, please display it on the screen, and uh, you know, and we'll be happy to uh, you know say, send you a copy of the book. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, fifty dollars, but you know, uh, per copy. It's um, and and it's all you know. We have actually signed off our rights to uh, our respective organizations. I I'm part of the you know uh, VHPA and uh, Kalyanji, of course. Uh, is part of Hindu University of America. So any proceeds from the book go directly to these organizations. Um, you know, it's uh, not meant to be a profit generator for you know for either one of us. So yeah, please. Uh, and and uh, I just want to also before before you know we, we um, drop off, I just want to read a couple of uh, lines by some prominent people in uh, you know uh, in our society. Who have written, uh, you know, a couple of nice lines about the book. I thought, you know, your audience might want to know. So, uh, Dr. Svashkak is very well known uh, uh, to to most Hindus in North America as well as, you know, the rest of the world. He says it's a beautifully produced book that presents many aspects of the Indian experience in America and contributions of Indians to American life. Um, and Professor Vedananda is a, a, a you know he's a tall figure in you know in the uh, Hindu diaspora here, and uh, you know he's written a pretty long uh, paragraph, but I'll just read one line here. He says this book should adorn every Hindu American's coffee table. So um, I think with that with that thought, um, thank you for uh, you know for giving us the opportunity to talk about. Uh, what is you know feels like actually a baby, uh, our baby. But now we're sending this baby out into the world to be on its own, and uh, hopefully it'll find its right place, uh, you know, uh, in the world and be a stand on its own feet. Thank you very much, uh, Jay Bansal ji. Thank you very much, Kalyan ji, for writing this book. First of all, and uh, secondly, thank you for uh, your time today. Uh, participating in our show and uh, I'm pretty confident that this book will create a buzz in our community, not just in our community, in our broader society, uh, what we call uh, North America. So Canada and uh, America both welcome your book and we are eager to read this book. Thank you very much for joining us today. ویوز بات چیز سن رہے تھے آپ ہندویزم اینڈ امریکہ ایک بہت ہی بڑیا بک ہے یہ صرف بک ہی نہیں ہے ایک ڈاکومنٹری ہے اور جو پورے کا پورا ہندو سماج کا امریکہ میں پرسپیکٹیو ہے وہ آپ کو اس میں پڑھنے کو ملے گا اور اس بک کا سب ٹائٹل ہے ہاو ہندو دھرما ٹرانسفارمنگ دا ویسٹ اس بک کو آپ بائی کیجئے اس بک کو پڑھئے سکرین پہ آپ کو ہم بار بار دکھاتے رہے ہیں کہ اس بک کو بائی کیسے کیا جا سکتا ہے اس بک پہ آنے والے دنوں میں اور بات چیت ہوگی جیسا کہ میں نے کہا یہ صرف بک ہی نہیں بلکہ پورے کا پورا اتحاس ہے اور پورے کا پورا فیوچر ہے ہندو دھرما کا امریکہ کے اندر آج کی اس بک پر 
बातचीत देखने और सुनने का बहुत शुक्रिया और इसके साथ साथ आप हमारे YouTube के चैनल को सब्सक्राइब करना चाहें तो आप सब्सक्राइब कर सकते हैं अगर आप हमें डोनेट करना चाहें तो इसी YouTube के चैनल पे डोनेट के बटन को क्लिक करेंगे तो आप हमें पेट्रियॉन पेपॉल और क्रेडिट कार्ड के राही कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट भी कर सकते हैं Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.